Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful in oil country and around the world. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? <laughs> well, I'm uh, I'm okay. We got a we got a snowy day in April. We need the snow though. Uh, we, we it was pretty. We need the moisture out there. Lots of it's too dry. Anyway, Bruce, um, a hideous loss to the Calgary Flames, five nothing. You know, it was a, it was a, kind of a. It was the third game in four nights for the Oilers, and um, but man, that was a terrible effort by the Oilers. They had three Grade A chances. The Flames had nine. Uh, they weren't really ever that into this game, that close in this game. And um, let's just get right to it. Two good yeah. things, two bad things, two numbers. And because it's a, a hideous loss, we'll go with two bad things each. Sure. What's your bad? Th- what's your? Well, <laughs> I guess we should start with the good things if we can. Let's start with the good thing, Bruce. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm going to honor the memory of the late Colby Cave is my good thing today. The Orders, uh, well, the Cave family hosted a celebration of life for uh, Colby this morning uh, on what was scheduled all along to be an off day for the Orders. And the Orders attended this thing online this morning, missed the morning skate, missed their game day routine, remembered with sadness a, a friend and teammate who died uh, uh, very tragically, uh, just completely out of the blue last year. A very fine man, Colby, and uh, his many attributes were delivered time and again to uh, uh, throughout the ceremony this morning. And I can understand how, um, you know, even as sort of a fan that's never met the guy, you know, I found it draining to sit through that. And I can understand how it would take the attention from uh, uh, of the players uh, from ordinary routines, and uh, Connor McDavid in the post game tonight even mentioned that fact that I've been <clears throat> mentioning to my wife throughout the game that uh, uh, he thought that the uh, NHL had done the orders no favors in uh, scheduling, rescheduling them to fill a slot uh, on a, this particular day when this thing had long been planned to be held in the morning and. Unfortunately, what they got was, uh, well, this is my good thing. Uh, R.I.P. Colby Cave, you are missed. To Colby, yeah, that, uh, that's such a tragedy. Mm-hmm. Still sa- very sad. A year, a year later, and it's still hard to get your head around it, isn't it? Well, imagine being in that dressing room. You're just surrounded by other, you know, young, vibrant people, and mm-hmm. for one of them to, to die... It just must be astonishing, shocking. Yeah, it's not a terrible thing. All right. um, My good thing, Bruce, is similarly kind of a, well, the the Oilers needed, I think they're they're a a team in need of a reality check Mm -hmm. in that they've been winning a lot of games, Bruce, but they've been doing it on fumes. They've been doing it on Mike Smith's good goaltending and some good puck luck, but they've been consistently outplayed both for the last 12 games, most of those games, especially at even strength. They've been good on the power play in those games. The Oilers, Bruce, uh, I just have a feeling that from from listening to Tippett, Coach Tippett, that he's he's not quite figuring it out like this team this team's in trouble right now this this isn't a good hockey team and it hasn't been for a while and the, the winning records masked that a little bit great to win those games but yep. um or maybe they completely are and that maybe that's why they're not making any moves at the trade deadline because they're just looking at this team and they don't think they have a chance but through 30 games this was a very good team in terms of scoring chance differential and in the last 12 games they haven't been that way at all so, and, and again, this night, three grade A chances, four or nine grade A chances against, that's just terrible. And so I think this is a wake-up call. Like if, if Holland was thinking this team 
is going to compete in the playoffs. This, this, I don't think this team is. And if Tippett's thinking, well, I'm, I'm trying everything. I don't think the coach is trying everything. And uh, he's got to, he's got to figure out some forward lines. You know, other than Leon Dreisaitl, Connor McDavid has chemistry with no one essentially right now. Um, the line of Cahoon, Yamamoto, and Dreisaitl has been tried all year long, Bruce. It ain't working. It's not moving the the needle uh, consistently. They've been they've had a pretty decent goal share, an okay goal share, but I think it's uh, you know I think it's some Leon's good shooting and skillful play that drives a uh, drives a lot of that, and it's it's him. It's it's a one you know it's one man right now, and it's McDavid on the other line. So it's just not working. What whatever Tippett's doing on the top lines, I'm not going to get into solutions tonight, but there's. You know, the trade deadline's coming up. There's players in the AHL they can call up. There's all, there's internal moves they can make. I think this is a, this should be a wake-up call for Tippett and Holland to think hard about this team heading into the playoffs because this, 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 this is a good team in a lot of ways. But they've got to, they've got to crack this code, and they're not even coming close right now. So my good thing is, is that that was the message. You can make a lot. There's all kinds of excuses about the loss in the game, and some of them are... Or just, you know, they're fair, justified excuses. But nonetheless, this isn't just tonight. This has been ongoing. So, wake up. What's your bad thing? <laughs> yeah, well, I kind of alluded to it already, mm -hmm. but I, I will go back to it because I think this was central to what happened here tonight. This is twice in the last two weeks that the Oilers have had an Eastern road trip of, uh, of multiple games where at the end of the road trip, they suddenly had an extra game added on because of illnesses that happened on other teams. Nothing that happened to the Oilers, but they're paying the price for it. And they had to go back into Montreal at the end of that earlier road trip where they spent a week sitting around Montreal because the Canadians were sick. And they went back into Montreal and they had nothing. Uh, that was a three and four night situation. And on that night, they got shut out 4 nothing. They had 17 shots to 32 by the Habs. Uh, they had, I think it was 2 to 17 were the grade A scoring chances. So we'll call that yeah. one the worst game of the season. Yeah. And in that game, they had, of their 17 shots, 7 were by forwards, 10 by defense. So they weren't even, you know, getting penetration to even generate anything resembling a good look on net. Well, this time around, uh, they had they actually had a really good schedule set up. It was Monday, Wednesday, Friday, home for two days off, play Monday, Wednesday, two more days off, and then go on the road. Now all of a sudden they had to stuff an extra game in on the Saturday. Now they wait a week for Vancouver to come back, and now they have to when they come back they have to play Friday and Friday here or Saturday in Winnipeg, and more, you know, tough slogging. I think there's another four and six out of that that's coming up. So anyway, tonight. Uh, almost the exact same thing. They were all shot identical, 17-4, 32 against. 17 shots in the game. Tonight they had eight shots from forwards, nine from defense. Six forwards with zero shots in this game, just as they were in Montreal. And again, just no no life, no <clears throat> zip, no penetration. And, and you can say, well, they need to be professional about that. they got to be better about that. And and you you have a point. But at the same time, uh, I think, you know, you connect the dots, the exact same thing happened twice, and the team responded the same way twice. They had nothing in the tank. Like, I, I have a lot of trouble sort of even blaming players for playing poorly tonight, especially when you keep on the sort of extra dose of that uh, uh, that memorial service this morning. You know, and uh, I think McDavid had a darn good point when uh, he spoke up about it a little bit and cleared his throat in the... In the uh, in the post game, and I guess I mean the NHL got their wish of filling the dark hockey night in Canada late slot, but they sure didn't fill it with anything resembling entertaining hockey. This was a brutal hockey game. Yeah, if the announcers were struggling to make it sound at all interesting, although Kelly even, Herity even seemed... the pro Calgary announcers were kind of trying to uh, trying to find reasons to go soft on Edmonton and yeah, Kel and, Kelly Herity sounded pretty excited at times. Um, Bruce, my bad thing is Tyler Ennis. He is has been all year the Oilers forward most likely to make a major mistake on a grade-A chance uh, against. And I think tonight we saw a 
couple examples of it on goals. Um, I think it's this. We'll start with the the second goal, and um, which one was that? Uh, that's not the uh, okay. The, there's the geo goal. Oh, okay, this is the one where Calgary bursts into into Edmonton's end, and it's got a. Um, it's basically a three on three at that point. And the two defensemen are Oilers defensemen are on their men. And Ennis is in the kind of the high slot area. But instead of shoulder checking, he's he's puck watching. And he doesn't see Backlund, the third Flames man, coming into the zone. And he's just when Backlund gets the pass, Ennis is, is like 15, 20 feet away from him. He Backlund is so wide open on that play. So instead of Ennis like checking, going to cover that man and cover off a pass to him, he's just kind of standing there. And then the 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 pass goes over to um, to Hannafin, and um, I'm sure that I think it was Hannafin, yeah, who who goes in and goes cross seam to Gaudreau, and um, goal scored. So that's that's just one example. Then the next time, um, it's the next one. It's uh, the fourth goal. Let me just look for it here, Bruce. Sorry. That was Gio's goal, wasn't it? Gio's goal. And he is, again, just kind of standing there 15 away, fifteen feet away from Giordano and lets him go right down the wing. You know, it's his man, and he just lets him cruise right in there right, and, and score. So I don't know, you know, I think you can do a little bit better than that. And it's typical of Ennis's defensive play this year, unfortunately. Big fat minus two to show for it. And uh, the, his line with uh, Paul Yarvey and McDavid, defensively, their structure was very poor. And uh, neither winger was really where he belonged for chunks of time. And McDavid, I mean, McDavid is McDavid. Sometimes you'll see, like there was one play where he made an absolutely <clears throat> brilliant defensive stop where he came out of nowhere to take away a great scoring chance but there's other times that he's just not where he should be or what have you but uh they just weren't focused and you know again we can talk about what the reasons for that were. but they the, the team collectively like their defensive structure was poor their execution of breakouts was poor their ability to get the puck over their own blue line or get it over center and get it deep was poor and uh, behind all that, their goaltending was poor. So, you know, like that Geo shot, I mean, it was sort of a nothing chance for Giordano until it leaked through and into the net. You know, I mean, Mike Smith had an off game too. Yeah, McDavid, it was McDavid was on the, on the second goal. He could have, you know, been covering Gaudreau, but, but he was not. And um, that was part of it. Bruce, what's your second bad thing? Well, because I've got a two, I guess I will have to go and point a finger at a player. And I'm going to, uh, again, sorry, single out Zach Cassian, who uh, on this four-game road trip, four games, he played 44 minutes and he had zero shots on net. Tonight he had zero shot attempts on net, which has happened in three of the four games where he didn't even attempt a shot. Uh, last game in Ottawa, at least he was somewhere near the net a couple of times. Tonight he added to that with zero hits, like Cassie Campbell was trying to commiserate with him, and she said, well, it was the kind of game where you could have used a big hit from Zach Cassian. And I'm going, yeah, they sure could have used a big hit from Zach Cassian. But he's had zero shots in nine of his last ten games. He's a forward. I mean, you could look at defensemen, and you wouldn't find a defenseman that had zeros, as many zeros, like 12 of his... Uh, Last 14 games, Cassian's had zero shots. In the, other, in the other games, he's had one and two. So he had three shots in his last 14 games. He's a forward. And he's like the, what, fourth, fifth highest paid forward on the team? Like, he's supposed to be generating something. And yeah. tonight, like his, his stat line, uh, event summary reads, no goals or points, one penalty for two minutes. No shot attempts, no hits, no giveaways, no takeaways, no block shots, no nothing. It's like a complete blank slate. It's like he wasn't even there. And I'd say that's a fairly accurate description of the way he played. Bruce, he is playing so poorly, he deserves to be waived or sent to the AHL at this point. 
I mean, I don't think you want to battle all night. And um, I, I guess I'm kind of tired of hearing, well, if, if only the crowd was there. Well, the crowd hasn't been there for some time. And the players have to, you know, if, if you're a professional athlete, you have to adjust. And he is not, he has not adjusted. I think there is some excuse he could be made that he was injured and he's coming back from injury. Mm-hmm. That said, it's been consistently bad for the last year, ever since he signed his new contract, essentially. And he's showing, he's showing less, less and less signs of turning it around. He's showing less and less. Um, he just was constantly giving away the puck and losing battles all game long. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, it's not often we give twos in game grades, but I gave him a two tonight. Hey, I just want to quickly correct my Ennis comment. It was on the first goal, he was caught flat-footed as Hannafin comes down and sets up Gaudreau. It's it's on the second goal. This is why I was a little confused there. It's on the second goal that he doesn't cover Backlund. And that's when Backlund puts it over to Giordano. That's when okay. Ennis is way off him. So my mistake there in describing that. Bruce, my second bad thing is Ethan Bear. Second, I think it's is the second bad game in a row for him, rough game in a row for him after a string of pretty good ones. He and Caleb Jones <laughs> had a little bit of a night tonight. I don't, it was mostly though on Bear. Um, he was at least twice, he made bad pinches that led to odd man rushes and one of them led to the goal, a goal against. Mm-hmm. And... Um, he just he, on, on the on the goal. First of all, he makes a bad pinch where he loses the battle in the offensive zone. Then Cahoon loses the battle, and then Bear charges back, and he's on. And and it's, and, a, and he instead of taking Sean Monahan, he he kind of goes for the puck, and um, the puck, of course, goes to his man Sean Monahan, who scores. So it's 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 baffling with Ethan Bear this year. The kind of mental errors we're seeing because I thought he had turned it around. Maybe he's just going to be inconsistent. But um, you're a third-pairing defenseman. You're not usually facing the tough minutes, he and Jones. Right. And they're getting, they're getting, they were outshot badly tonight together. They're getting so was um, out. Yeah, so is pretty much everyone, except for Nurse and uh, <clears throat> Barry's pairing. Yeah. But these are e- easier minutes that these guys are getting, and they're not handling them particularly well. So... This just adds to the frustration, of course, of Evan Bouchard sitting there for the, since March 1st, not playing a game. What is it, a month and a half? You couldn't find a game to get Evan Bouchard in there in that whole month and a half, like tonight, maybe, you know? Um, well, tonight they finally had, like for a while there, he's been locked out, right? Because they've had no way to get him off the taxi squad and in the lineup. But after they waived tourists on uh, Thursday morning, was it Friday Friday morning? And after they put R and H on uh, on injured reserve, which I think is short term, but for tonight, that opened up two spots, and they got they got Tyler Ennis and James Neal in at least to get a game because on Monday that all changes, and and they won't have near the flexibility of using the taxi squad as they did before. So, good idea to get those guys a game, but it could have been Evan Bouchard that got a game, and. The way, I mean, geez, they might as well put Alex Stalock in that tonight. I mean, the way this game was, that uh, it was um, one where where Bouchard maybe could have got some ice, but at some point they're going to have to put him in, aren't they? You'd think, Bruce, but and couldn't he? Well, he surely could have surely could have played better than Ethan Bear played tonight. But I mean, you never know heading into the game. Nonetheless, I I just. It's 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 getting a little bit dicey with Bear and Jones, and it's interesting that you, you hear a lot of talk about now Edmonton looking to pick up a defenseman at the trading deadline. That's something that hadn't been coming up at all all year long. Wasn't any no one ever talked about that, and yeah. suddenly in the last two weeks, all the kind of the team insiders are starting to put these hints out there. You know, I still think personally that the they need another forward more than they need another defenseman. These defensemen they have have got to sort it out um, and start playing better. Well, the three young guys they got playing third pairing and the fourth young guy that isn't playing at all, you know, they're all struggling. They're all struggling. Like, 
Bear, or Jones, Slagason, none of them. You know, Bear had a nice run of maybe four good games in a row here a while back after having a couple of real, real bad nights. And now he's had a couple of bad nights again. And Jones is having trouble getting traction. And Lagason uh, had it going on for a while that he was running uh, hot on percentages. And that caught up with him in his most recent run of games. And, and there's nobody that seems to be stepping up and saying, I'm grabbing this third pairing job. Mm-hmm. Certainly not on the left side. It wouldn't surprise me at all if they picked up a left defense. Yeah. Well, that's what they're talking about because they mm-hmm. sh- they don't need another right one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Bear just got off on the wrong foot like early in the game. He's at center ice and he gives the puck away, and they go in there and Giordano gets a good shot from the slot. It's just it just seems like it's uh, one thing after another. If it, things start to go poorly, they don't seem to be able to snap out of it too well. Bruce, what's your number? Oh, uh, well, I was going to go with zero, but I think I said zero so many times during the podcast. I'm going to switch gears and I'm going to go positive. I'm going to say something positive. So my number is five, and that is number point seven Edmonton took from this four-game road trip to Montreal, Ottawa, Ottawa, and Calgary, four and six nights. And anytime you come back from a lengthy road trip, especially one that takes you, you know, time zones away, with more points than you have games played, that's a positive thing. So bank those five points, you know, however you got them, and it wasn't pretty. I don't think any of those games was particularly pretty from the Oilers' perspective, but uh, they they uh, uh, they were able to get a result from the first three games, and tonight was a throwaway. So let's treat it as that, and let's note the fact that, you know, what could have been, you know, 0-3 in one road trip or something, that really would have uh, uh, put them, you know, knock them down the charts a bit, is a pretty acceptable result overall. Here's uh, McDavid's quote that you were referencing earlier, uh, Bruce. He says, quote, you're asking a lot from guys to sit through something like that. Remember your teammate, see what the whole family is going through and be expected to perform that night. I'm not sure what the league was really thinking there, unquote. Yeah, so well said, Connor McDavid, and good for speaking up. He is right. Yeah, that's they a, that's didn't have a, many options. I mean, if they wanted to fill the late game, that you know, I mean, it was supposed to be Vancouver and Calgary, but but uh, Vancouver wasn't available, and the other four teams were all playing scheduled games at the, in the five o'clock slot. But uh, with that celebration of life scheduled in there, it was a tall ask, and and uh, uh, unfortunately, what they got wasn't a very entertaining product. All right, my number, Bruce, is I just want to highlight the problems with the Oilers' attack because I think that it really is struggling right now. Mm-hmm. And um, so the, through the first 30 games, the Oilers averaged 12.8 grade-A scoring chances per game, 12.8 per game. In the last 12, Bruce, they've averaged 7.8. That's mm-hmm. a drop in five grade-A chances per game in the last 12 games. And uh, I just I just really do think that this is this is – this is a coaching staff that has to think hard about what what they're doing with their top lines, and um, thinking. All think, go ahead. All situations, right? That's like power plays and everything. That, that, That's all situations. Right. Yeah, that includes power plays where they've actually still been won a game that they tend to be well, getting. Yeah, yeah, they weren't very good tonight, but but the power play, at least when it's out there, has been clicking, and and they they have an advantage. And you can say, well, the things are just tightening up. But at the same time, as uh, you know, they were in the first 30 games, they gave 10.2 grade A chances against, and now they're at 10.9 grade A chances against in the last 12 games. So it's not just a matter of things tightening up and everyone getting less grade A chances. This is a, this is this is what's going on with the owners, and this is why we're doing this. This is why part of why we do this scoring chance work is to see trends like this. So early in the year. When people are upset and worried about the team, we can say, hey, you know, look at, you know, yeah, they're losing, but they're consistently outchancing the opposition. This is a good team. There, you can, this team's going to win. And that's what we said. And that's what happened. And right now I'm saying, you know, you know these, we're not just doing this work to be positive about the owners all the time. It's to give us an idea of what, what is their real performance in a game. And in the last 12 games, despite winning seven of them, there's some there's some really um, arresting trends here that that uh, 
Holland and Tippett need to take note of and try to figure out how they're going to do it. You know, one way to get more offense into your lineup, Bruce, is put a player like Evan Bouchard in your lineup. Yeah. You have this scintillating young offensive defenseman, and he's been sitting that, you know, sitting, sitting, sitting. Maybe think about that. Is that really the right idea? Are you, are you being way too conservative? Which, you know, I'm, and these are rhetorical questions, obviously. I think that they're being way too conservative at this point, and they need to play that player. And they need to, I think they need to try to, if they can, figure out a way to get a player, an offensive player, um, at the trade deadline. That should be their priority, not another defenseman. They've got lots of defensemen. Just start playing, maybe start playing Evan Bouchard. You've got a defenseman. Just give him a try. So, Bruce, <coughs> we're hearing some names. Jim Matheson of the Journal talked about uh, Ricard Raquel mm-hmm. um, of the Anaheim Ducks as a possibility for the Oilers. And, of course, Taylor Hall has been rumored a uh, little bit. Since 10 minutes after he left Edmonton. <laughs> exactly. It's been unrelenting. It has. Uh, we, we can't get enough of it. We cannot get enough of it. And, I, Bruce, you know, I've had enough of it. <laughs> on Oilers now, Bob Stoffer has been saying this isn't going to happen, right? It's, he's been clearly telegraphing the Oilers. I think he said maybe a one in a thousand chance or something like that. And I, and I I accept that as true unless you know unless Buffalo's price drops to like I don't know like a second round draft pick. Um, uh, I don't see that. I don't see it happening. But anyway, what do you think of Raquel? Because he's got a year left on his contract, I believe. Yeah, uh, I know this player pretty well because I had him in my keeper league for a number of years. Yeah, and he was a real good performer. He had to back to back. Uh, seasons of 33 and 34 goals in Anaheim. But those seasons were back in 2016-17 and 17-18. And since then, he's dropped from 18 to 15. And this year, just seven goals in 37 games. And he's just, you know, he's lost whatever scoring touch he's had. Like his, his production goals per game production rate has basically been in half in the last three years than it was in the prior two years. And I haven't seen a lot. Of, I, I haven't seen Anaheim play a game this season, to be honest with you. But uh, uh, I haven't seen a lot of them in, in uh, or a lot of him in the last couple of years, other than games against the Oilers, where he used to be a constant threat. So, and he's also gone. And again, this is always a grain of salt um, figure, but he's gone from you know plus ten, plus six, those two big years, to minus thirteen, minus five, minus nine. Like he's, uh, but of course the team is worse, so that's got a lot to do with that. But still, he's his his overall box car stats have taken a tumble, and so the question is, which Ricard Raquel are you getting? Uh, Maddie said in his tweet, this was one key item that he'd been out of the lineup for uh, the last. 10 days to two weeks, I think, with some kind of a head issue that was rumored to be a possible concussion. But apparently he's through that, according to what what, what Jim said, uh, in which case he's a viable trade candidate. And, I mean, there's a lot to like about the player. I mean, he's 27 years old. Uh, he's, you know, middling size. He's a right shot, but capable and happy to play on the left side, which is where the orders need snipers. And uh, so... He's a, he's an interesting target. Is he worth a first round draft pick? Is he worth a first round tra- draft pick plus more? He's uh, he's under control. He's got one more year, and I think it's around three point eight million dollars, somewhere in that range. So uh, he's not free, but uh, you know he's uh, he's not taking in big bucks, and uh, uh, he's a guy you know that in, in theory. Uh, he could uh, provide, a, you know, a, a shooter that they could put on the top six, and boy, do they need one. So, so this year, Bruce Raquel is 157th in scoring for NHL forwards, um, mm-hmm. out of I think it's like 415 regular forwards. So that points translates for 60, five, points five, per five, sixty, five, even points strength, per 60. yeah, one point yeah. seven three okay. per sixty. So that's about the same level of scoring as Tyler Ennis. Now, I don't know what Raquel is like as a defensive player, but um, that's not terrible. Like that, It's not high. It's not a top-line scoring, but it is second-line scoring mm-hmm. uh, in the NHL this year. So 
even though his point scoring is down this year, you know, and this is a small sample size, and we we're not neither of us are watching this player, so we can't tell. But Taylor Hall is considerably below that. Taylor Hall is like you know, two hundred and sixtieth out of four hundred and fifteen. 415 players and uh you know taylor hall is the other name here's what ken campbell of the hockey news says about taylor hall today he says quote i can't be the only person who believes that taylor hall will make almost zero difference to whatever team acquires him can i marginal marginal upgrade at best there are at least 15 players for whom i would try to trade at this deadline before him unquote so you know i can't I'm not going to comment on Taylor Hall as a player. His point scoring is is atrocious this year. His power play scoring is atrocious. But sometimes that can come down to puck luck. And it can come down, you know, over a short span of games, it can come down to that. But it's not just that. Because this has been a, it's it's kind of a, his he's been trending down since his MVP year. And trending down considerably. And unless his defense is picked up since he was in Edmonton, um, you have to wonder um, if Ken Campbell doesn't have a bit of a point at least. Um, you know, I'd be excited if the orders got Tater Hall in a trade and didn't have to give up too much. I mean, that, that I, I think that would be really interesting and I, I would be okay with that. But I, uh, yeah, like a first round pick for this player, you know, the, the, the Sabres would have to eat a, a pretty good contract for that to happen. Well, he's an exciting and dynamic player to watch. There's, I mean, that's, that's a given. Uh, and a new lease on life getting out of Buffalo after all that's gone wrong there this year, which includes, I mean, they had their own crappy fortune with the COVID thing when uh, they played a two-game series against New Jersey Devils back at the end of January. And the Devils were sick coming into the series, and by the end of the weekend, both teams had, like, massive... Um, player losses and, the, and Sabres didn't play a game for two weeks and since they came back it's like Hall's been a shadow of himself and really they've all been like the whole team what they lose 18 in a row I think and they uh uh and there's but there's just been no signs of life out of the guy at least you know from the numbers perspective there's nothing saying you know he's killing it but he just isn't you know it's it's just not there, and it's it's. I mean, even when they finally broke out of the the losing streak and they beat someone six one, I thought that night, aha, uh-huh, I'm going to look in there and Hall's going to have two three points and uh, had a good game, and he was zeros across the board. You know, wasn't even on the ice for a goal. It was, and they they won six to one. It was like just another night where nothing happened from his personal perspective. But you know, it's it. He's he's a he's an energetic and emotional player that like say a, a fresh start somewhere and maybe something in Edmonton would spark him, but you're sure rolling the dice. I I, I don't think there's any 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 way you uh, you can look at him as any kind of a sure thing. Yeah, you'd have to. Uh, I mean, again, we're not watching this player, so we can't really say. Are you have you what have you seen him? Did you say I I haven't seen him play, so I'm not. I saw, I'm not yeah, I saw a couple. Of, I will actually watch both games of that New Jersey series, believe it or not, where that that was a Saturday and Sunday afternoon, and they were both on NBC or whatever in the afternoon, and and uh, I saw bits and pieces of those games, and he was sort of you know sporadically dangerous, but nothing ever came out of it. You know, he'd break into the zone, he'd make a shot or make a decent pass, but you know, they wouldn't score and a way to go the other way and and often wind up in the net, you know, it's uh Buffalo is a, a disaster zone, but it's uh you know, it's way more than just him. But uh it's rippled through the whole team, you know, that uh I mean we talk in Edmonton about uh uh the uh you know, the big three, McDavid, Dreisaitl, and Nugent Hopkins making $27 million. Well, in Buffalo, their big three of Eichel, Skinner, and Hall, they make the exact same, $27 million against the cap. Right? Just an absolute huge chunk for three players. And those three players, Taylor Hall has two goals, Jack Eichel has two goals, and where are we now? We're going to go way down here. Jeff Skinner's up to four now. 
So eight goals for the three of them. The Oilers, $27 million man, have 57 goals. Buffaloes have eight. <laughs> and it's just chaos and, and catastrophe in Buffalo again. So uh, it's certainly, they're certainly going to be sellers. Let's put it that way. And Hall's on a, on a one-year expiring contract with no particular reason to be loyal to the Sabres and probably going elsewhere. So they're, they're going to be trying to move them along. But who knows what they'll get. I mean, a lot of the 200 hockey men would have opinions similar to Ken Campbell, but not all of them. You just need one. You need one to be excited. So, but it doesn't sound like that may not be. They may not be able to find that one. Correct. So, say. what are you hoping for at the trade deadline, Bruce? If you're completely honest, what would you? What would, you, what would be your preference? Uh boy, that third pairing defenseman is is tempting, but I think scoring winger. I, I'm I'm becoming I'm disillusioned with the uh, inability of the uh, wingers with McDavid and Drysaddle to put the puck in the net. And it's, uh, you know, it's gone from being, well, they score occasionally to, well, they're not scoring very much at all. And they're not looking very dangerous in the, in the process. Like Dominic Cahoon, like you have sightings of that guy sporadically, but not frequently. And, uh, you know, Kyler Yamamoto, he's a good promising young player and needs to work on a shot in order and, and learn how to finish some of his chances. And the same goes uh, probably for Yesipul Yarvi. And we've talked quite a bit about Ryan Nugent Hopkins' uh, uh, relatively uh, poor season at even strength. And hey, presto, that's all four of your top six wingers when you're running uh, Connor and Leon down the middle. Right. So. Yeah. It seems like they've run out of ads, you know, in the current configuration, these two lines that they've stuck with all year, you know, um, it's just, it's, it ain't working. And, and, uh, I guess that's what I hope they, they finally figure out. And I was hoping Ennis would step up and have a good game. So they, you know, if RNH did come back, they could go back to the dynamite line, but. I was it, hoping Neil might come out with a burr in his uh, in, under his saddle, you know, but uh, he was a non-factor in this game as well. No shots. Yeah. You know, yeah. I guess, I, I, you know, yeah. Again, if it was just tonight, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be in this mood or, or making these kind of comments because there was all kinds of extenuating circumstances, mm-hmm. tonight, especially the Colby Cave Memorial. And, and um, you know, which is a huge factor in tonight's play. There's just no doubt about it. So, alrighty, Bruce. Well, um, there's going to be a, we'll probably have a podcast on Monday, I'm guessing, eh? Because of the yeah, well, trade been, deadline coming up. It's been a few trades, David. I mean, here we have, uh, on one hand, we have Ken Holland sticking to dollar in, dollar out. On the other hand, we have the Tampa Bay Lightning, who've already stashed a, former Hart Trophy winner Nikita Kucherov in this $10 million contract or whatever it is on long-term injured reserve. That's just miraculously he's going to be cured just as the playoffs begin. And so they're also on long-term injured reserve restrictions. And yet somehow today they were able to make a trade for a $4.25 million defenseman in David Savard. So if you can get creative, you can still add salary without necessarily dollar in dollar out i mean what they did with with that was they had uh they had columbus retain half and then they went through a second team which i think was detroit and they retained half of the other half so uh, tampa bay wound up only with a quarter of the four and a quarter million dollar salary which is about 1.06 million dollars well guess what when you ship a guy out from the nhl to the ahl uh you can save 1.07 million off of the cap hit. So that's how they'll cover it. They'll, they'll shift someone off the roster and they've just brought a guy in. That's basically at the AHL cutoff rate of uh, just over $1 million, except for he's a real good player, experienced right shot defenseman, you know, highly in demand. And somehow Julian Breezebaugh got creative enough to make that happen. Somehow in Toronto, uh, Kyle Dubas got creative enough to add Riley Nash, uh, a uh, experienced right shot defensive minute center, to the roster 
uh, where he's hurt, so he's going to go on long-term injured reserve, and somehow that's going to actually make Toronto more cap, where they've added a player and given themselves more cap space. I, I, I still don't under, quite understand how that works. It's uh, it's some kind of voodoo, uh, and there's you know seriously a flaw, a loophole in the CBA that that some of them have figured out. But when you have guys like Julian Brisebois and Kyle Duba who are making these kind of uh, of uh, creative moves to add depth for the playoffs, then maybe you should be looking at your own GM to be, get a little creative himself. Yeah, there's 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 some teams you know that are clearly there's four teams that are above 700 in the in the NHL right now: Toronto, Colorado, Carolina, and Tampa Bay. But there's other other teams that are in that rung. Uh, between 700 and 600 winning per- percentage, and the orders are at 619 right now. There's other teams in that group, and even one below 600, Montreal, where they're talking about making moves. Mon- Montreal's already made a move, and everyone just seems to think that's natural and normal in the GMs. Mm-hmm. And, but for some reason, the narrative is here is, oh no, like no, we can't, we can't, no moves. Our this hands year. We're, are we're, tied. We're in next year country, our hands are tied. And I don't get it, honestly. Like you have this. Like you have Mike Smith playing so well. You have this number one goalie playing well. You've got Darnell Nurse. Goalie. I don't you're, think you're so. essentially at this point renting Nugent Hopkins and Barry. Maybe you sign him, maybe you don't. Adam Larson, same deal, right? Mm-hmm. All these players, you, you, some of them you might not have next year. You have the two best young centers in the game. Why don't you go for it? Why don't you roll the dice? And I, I mean, I don't, the, the first pick that they're going to have is between 20 and 30 in the draft. And it's a that's a it's a crapshoot pick anyway, and you know chances are that that player if he's going to be a good player it's going to be three four five years from now, and I know and the the other thing is the the Oilers prospect cupboard isn't bare they've got all kinds of good young players bubbling up, so this seems to me like a, kind of a a good time maybe they you know and then well the, we hear about the salary cap they're just so hamstrung and then Tampa does what they did, as you say Bruce so. It's not adding up to me. Maybe uh, Ken Holland is playing poker, as he says, and is uh, and is getting to reveal, going to reveal his good hand. But I'm not buying the whole "it's okay to do nothing" thing. I don't think it's okay to do nothing. I think they should try to improve the team, and I think this is a team that could use some improving. So I hope that happens on Monday. Yeah. Well, so far the most most smoke has been around the. Uh... Uh, Detroit face off ace, the modern day Jared Smith's in there, in, yeah, uh, in, yeah, uh, in Detroit. Um, but I don't see that as you know, that's an issue, but it's not the issue with this team, yeah. Like, to, it's to talk about, I mean, Jude Arcara is scoring like he's a second line center this year, and uh, he's the third line center now, you know. They could win more face-offs, all these guys, but Kara's playing well. Haas is in a bit of a... Well, he, he's not playing that well lately. Um, he had a poor road trip, to my eye. Yeah, he's not playing that well. So I'm not... It's not the perfect position, but they have, you know, between Drysaddle and McDavid and Kara, they're pretty good at one, two, three, if you ask me. And if Haas is the fourth center, that's... It's not going to kill you in the playoffs. He's a, he can He can hold his own. So... But what's going on is their top line attacking has collapsed at even strength, unless you put McDavid and Dreisaitl together. That's what they got to figure out and fix. That's the priority on this team. And um, I hope they get after it. We'll see. Well, their scoring leaders right now are 1-2 in the league, McDavid and Dreisaitl. But 3-4 and four of the team are both defensemen, Barry and Nurse. Then there's one forward, Nugent Hopkins, piling them in on the power play. It's got 28 points, and then the gap is all the way to 18. And you know, and, there, and then there's, you know, eighth on the team has 11 points. So there's no real depth of scoring there, even still. Alrighty, well let's leave it there, Bruce. For today. Yeah, we'll see what Monday brings, and uh, we'll be uh, we'll be covering that. Uh, on Monday, as well as everybody in the hockey world, that's always a, a fun day, the trade deadline. And hopefully there'll be some positive news to report for the orders. And in the meantime, and in between time, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey.
podcast. Thanks for listening, everyone. And thanks for talking, Bruce. Uh, R.I.P. Colby.